Sea cattles, also wrongly called cattle fish, are masters of disguise. Seriously, chameleons don't even compete. But that's not the only cool thing about these cute blobs of awesome. So today we're going to talk about cattles and bobtail squid. First, as always, let's quickly orient ourselves on where we are in the tree of life. If you get lost, I recommend watching the previous episodes of this series. I know the first few are only there as audio format, but I'm currently re-recording them to make sure they are with video here on YouTube. Hold tight, they'll be there soon. We covered all the bacterial shit and a bunch of little and simple stuff after that. We skipped over the plants and fungi, though we will get back to those at some point to reach the animals. From there we covered more cool groups like the sea sponges and the corals and sea jellies and such to reach the bilateria, so animals with two symmetrical halves like us. Most of the mollusks, including clams and mussels, snails and slugs are covered. We also covered the nautiluses and the squid. I'm sure we'll return to snails at some point and definitely return to the freaky cool nudie pranks because with all of their colors I just have to make them an entire episode at some point. But another time. For now, they are covered. At the moment we're talking about the cephalopods, the group that contains one of my favorite animals, the octopus. Within the cephalopods there are two extant so living groups. There's the shelled ones, the nautiloidea, and the shellless ones, the coleoidea. We already talked about the nautiluses and the more recent allonautiluses, so the shelled freaky cool ones, and last time I got overly excited about squid. That leaves us with two more groups within the coleoids, the, the cuttles and the octopuses. You might remember from the squid episode, the coleoidea are divided by the number of their appendages. There's the eight-limbed octopodiforms and the ten-limbed decapodiforms. The squid, the two theta, are decapodiforms, and so are the two groups we're talking about today, the cuttles and the bobtail squids, which together make up the sepida. We'll get into the octopodiforms next time when we talk about the octopuses, but for now we're staying with the decapodiforms. Last time we also quickly covered the spirulida, with the whooping one living member, the spirula spirula, the ram's horn squid, that isn't a squid. We also talked about a weird hybrid, the idiosepius, the pygmy squids, because they were just too cute not to talk about, and also where else would I fit them in? They are currently hovering undefined within the decapodiforms, waiting to become either their own branch or to be sorted into one of the others. But they were just so cute and I had to talk about them someplace and they fit there better than here, so I guess... As promised, we'll talk about another weird hybrid today, the bobtail squids. They are so adorable and cute that we definitely have to talk about them, but despite their stellar naming, they aren't squid, so they fit here better than they did last time. We'll get into that mess later. Before we get deeper into the cuttles, let's talk about their naming for a moment. Most people know them better as cuttle fish. And that just doesn't make any sense at all, because they aren't fish. None of them is fish. It's like the whole starfish nonsense. And I know we haven't talked about what starfish actually are, we'll do that when we reach that branch, but they definitely aren't fish. So why would you call them fish? Scientists and other cool people have been trying to rename things that are wrongly named a little more accurately. So they are trying to claim sea star for the star fish and cuttles for the cuttle fish and so on. Some part of me really wants to go onto the Wikipedia page for cuttlefish and change every single name to cuttle because they aren't fish. And maybe a note on how stupid the cuttlefish name is? Yeah, but I have a feeling it wouldn't get approved, so I'm not sure if I should even try. Okay, to make things more confusing, let's just look at taxonomy for a second. Remember the nautiluses with their weird naughty something layers? The sepida aren't much better. To get to the cuttles, we need to go into the sepida, from there we go into the sepina, and then the sepidae. It again only makes sense if you care about all the stuff that isn't alive anymore today, and I really don't. So the sepida are divided into two extant groups. There's the cuttles, the sepidae, well technically their overarching group, but only they are alive so we'll ignore that, and there's the bobtails, the sepiolidae. Yeah, those two groups are the only ones we care about, and we'll ignore everything else because it's just easier. I know all that naming makes sense. If you look at all the extinct groups, all those naming levels have a reason and they have a meaning. 
but I'm not a historian. I prefer live things. Both the bobtails and the cuttles have subgroups, but I don't want to bore you to death, so we won't get into any of those. I had a really, really hard time deciding which group to talk about first today because they are both fucking cute and fucking cool. So I literally flipped a coin. Well, not literally. I asked an AI to flip a coin. Yeah, the answer was heads. And as the bobtails obviously were tails, we're going to talk about the cuttles first. So what the fuck's a cuttle? Cuttles are marine mollusks, which you've probably guessed because they are cephalopods and cephalopods are mollusks, right? Yeah, well, like most mollusks, they are essentially everywhere on this planet, but these little friends don't like it too cold. Some of them, like the common cuttle, Sepia officinalis, has adapted to the English Channel, though. So that's not the Arctic, but it is cold water. Similarly, they usually stay in shallower waters, because warmer and more food, but they have been found at deeper depth. Wikipedia says it's around 600 meters, so 2,000 feet, but I can't find anything scientific to back that up, and everyone just seems to summarize Wikipedia and... Yeah, or they mix up squid and cattles mid-sentence and are fucking inaccurate in general and can't be trusted, so not much out there on cattles. Okay, admittedly I haven't answered the question of what cattles are, so let's do that now. They are a lot like squid, to be honest. But you can tell them apart. Like squid, they have eight arms and two tentacles. You might remember from the last episode that tentacles are the ones with suckers only on the last bit and arms are the ones with suckers along the entire length. Tentacles are also more stretchy because they use them to catch prey. Yeah, easy enough. Most people would not be able to tell squid and cuttles apart unless it's a species that they've seen before and know. But if you pay attention, there are ways to tell them apart. The easiest way is probably by what their reduced shell turned into. But that requires there to be no animal around that reduced shell, and I like alive animals better. But you might remember that squid have something called a gladius or a pens or a bendy thin rod that's kind of like their spine. Well, cuttles also no longer have an external shell, they have a reduced shell, and in their case it turned into a cuttle bone. You might have seen those around both in the aquarium trade and in pet bird cages, because it's very rich in calcium and often used there. The cuttle bone is also why cuttles won't like climate change much, because the ocean acidification that comes along with our excessive use of carbon dioxide is very bad for them keeping their cuttle bone in shape. They can actually use their cuttle bone for buoyancy, so how sinky or floaty you are. The cuttle bone is made from aragonite. I think we talked about that stuff in a previous episode. I'm pretty sure I'll try and find out which one is either the one on mussels or the one on the carbon cycle. One of those, not sure. Anyway, there are two forms of calcium carbonate. One is calcite and the other is aragonite. Calcite is more stable, while aragonite is more soluble, so more susceptible to ocean acidification. They are different and have different properties, but that's way too chemical or physical, I don't care. Um, and we won't go into that in depth now. So the tough stuff in mussels and other mollusks, but also the skeletons of some coral are made from this calcium carbonate, usually from a mixture of both of these forms. Either way, the cuttle bone is made from, made from calcium carbonate. And it's porous, so it has holes all throughout. And the cuttle can change the gas to liquid ratio in that cuttle bone surrounding department. So you remember from the Nautiluses maybe that they had something called a siphuncle. It was this tissue strand that went through the entire shell with which they drew water into the siphuncle and out of the chambers. Well, the cuttles also have a siphuncle and they can use it to control how buoyant they are with their cuttle bone. It's kind of like what the squid did with the ammonia. They just change their density in relation to the seawater and that determines if they float, sink or stay where they are. I told you that they all do buoyancy differently and we'll get into yet another way of buoyancy control when we talk about the octopuses next time. Well, yeah, kinda. Anyway, so the cuttles have a cuttle bone and the squid have a gladius or pen or whatever you want to call that thing 
and it's an easy way to tell them apart if you have a dead specimen because you found one, for example, at the beach. But luckily, there are better ways to figure out which one's which if you don't want to get all up in there. Cattles like squid have swimming fins along their mantle, that's the body, which they wave, wave, wave to make small movements happen. If they need to move faster, they also use jet propulsion, just like the squid. They have similar arms and tentacles, so none of that really helps you. Sure, their mantles are a bit broader, but that's kind of like all those articles telling you that you can sex animals because the females tend to be larger. That's just, both of them would need to be next to each other and hold still for me to compare size, unless it's like super obvious where it's like 20 times the size or whatever. But especially considering that there usually is a lot of size variability, so a small male might be smaller than a big female or the other way around, depending on the species and which one tends to be bigger. So that doesn't help me either. Luckily, there is a better way that works with live animals and doesn't require comparison. The easiest way, I think, is to tell them apart by their eyes. The shape of their pupils is different. I already told you how freakily close the cephalopod eye is to the human eye. Well, vertebrate eye in general. It's really amazing how they completely independently were created by evolution and now they work essentially the same. Well, the cephalopods just have one leg up on us. They manage to do it without the blind spot. You know where the nerve attaches, humans have a blind spot. Cephalopods don't have that. Otherwise, works exactly the same. But as I said, the shape of the pupil is different. Squid have a round pupil, like ours, kind of. And the cuttles have a W-shaped one. Yeah, a W-shape. I know. Sometimes the W looks more like a U, but who cares? Close enough. Definitely not round. And you can easily tell them apart by that. If they look sleepy as shit, they are cuddles. The bobtail squids are closely related to the cuddles. I mean, they're called squids, but despite their naming, they aren't squids, as we've already established. But they also don't have a cuddle bone, so they aren't cuddles either. They make up their own group within the sepida, the sepiolida. The sepiolids have an even broader and rounder mantle than the cuttles do, making them even cuter and cuddlier. They are also, on average, half the size of the cuttles. So they are very, very, very cute, and cuttles already aren't that big. The smallest one are probably the dwarf cuttles. I know, dwarf cuttles, very, very impressive naming. Zepia pandensis, while the largest one are probably the Australian giant cuttles. I know the naming is excellent. Zepia afama. A lot of pages seem to copy from each other and they quote Spirula Spirula as the smallest one, but we know better, right? Because we covered the Spirulida last time and they aren't cuttles. So the smallest cuttle is the dwarf cuttle with about 4 inches or 10 centimeters of mantle length. And even the biggest one, that Australian giant uh, cattle is only four times that size, so still not very big. Anyway, the bobtails are on average a lot smaller than that even. The Hawaiian bobtail squid, Euprimer scolopis, which we'll talk about a little more when we talk about camouflage, gets to a whooping three centimeters, so a little over an inch. That's teeny tiny and so adorable. Most of them seem to reach somewhere around five centimeters, so two inches, which just is so cute and adorable. For both cattles and bobtails, their lifespan is rather short, at least compared to the 20 or whatever it was years of the Nautiluses. They usually tend to reach a lot shorter lifespans. For the cattles, it's usually a year or two, while the bobtails are between three and nine months, so very, very short lives. Like squids, the bobtails and the cattles only mate once in their lifetime. For the cattles, that's either in their first or second year, and when exactly they mate, depends a lot on the environment and how quickly they grow, and it kind of also determines their lifespan. The bobtails usually are able to reach mating age at about two months, but considering their short lifespans, that kind of is necessary to be able to procreate at all. After they mate, they have put a lot of energy into the mating process, and they go into a state called senescence, which is kind of rotting away while they swim around, and then they usually get eaten very quickly after, because their eyesight gets worse and they get very slow and sluggish and it's just not good, but even if they don't get eaten, they don't live much longer after that. So both cattles and bobtails grow over their entire lifespan, and as the bigger male usually gets the female, 
how fast they grow usually determines how long they live before they mate. But there are other factors as we'll see. We already talked about the environment being a factor, but there's another factor, how sneaky they are. And that kind of segues well into camouflage. I already told you that they communicate with their bodies and they can hold two conversations. For example, signaling aggression to a rivaling male while courting a female, or even pretending to be female. But let's start at the beginning, camouflage. Like other cephalopods, they have ink that they can squirt if they need a little smoke screen to distract their predators. But considering how fucking awesome their camouflage is, I bet they need this less often than we think. But then again, I've seen an octopus squirt. Get humans into the picture and there's always someone making them squirt. It's just dive guide on a dive, trying to get an octopus out of their den, sticks their head in and scares the little thing. So yeah, he squirted. Like other cephalopods, cuttles are thought to be colorblind, which is kind of ironic considering how well they can camouflage. The Max Planck Institute for Brain Research and the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies at the Goethe University are both working hard to figure out how cuttles work exactly well, how their camouflage works, because they want to emulate it. And any AI they have at the moment that does the same thing, like look at an environment and decide how to camouflage, is super complex. And they think the fact that the cuttles have this trait of figuring it out inherited means that it has to be a simple mechanism behind the magic. I mean, sure, cuttles and octopuses are thought to have the biggest brains of all the invertebrates, but that sounds a lot less impressive if you consider what the competition is. No one would expect a slug to be the one with the biggest brain. Okay, cattle camouflage is magic. They cannot only decide how light or dark their skin is, how white or pink it is. They can also choose if it's smooth, coarse, bumpy, wrinkled, or if there are protrusions coming out of the skin making shapes. And bend light. As I said, magic. And they don't just blindly follow the pattern to blend in. They use their brain to control all of this. They look at their surroundings and somehow manage to extract the features that are most likely to make them blend in. It's really fucking impressive. How many patterns and shapes cattles can make depends on the species. And for the next bit, the sources overlap a little, so it was really hard to link them in the show notes. But I'm really glad I'm not writing a scientific paper and I hope you can figure it out. But Anyway, let's use the common cattle as an example. They have 16 light features, 17 dark features, 6 textural variations, 8 postural components and 6 locomotive, so movement related components, that allow them to blend in. And all of that is controlled by one brain and they figure out what to make all those combinations just by looking at their environment. It's just fucking impressive. Okay, so how does this work? They have a bunch of specialized cells on their skin. And kind of like a computer screen makes the image from pixels, they make the image from their different cells, building the patterns from the different cells. And they have three types of these special cells. The chromatophores are essentially elastic sags with pigment inside. When they are relaxed, they are closed, but when the brain sends the signal, they open up to expose the pigment inside. The exact color options depend on the species, but they aren't actually limited to those colors. But those pigments usually are red, orange, dark brown, things like that. And when they are closed, they tend to be more colorless, more white. And then they open it up to get the colors or the dark color. But yeah, there's more. This is just, they aren't limited to the colors and the pigments. It's really freaky because they also have iridophores. The iridophores allow them to bend the light and change what the color is perceived as. So if you bend light, it has a different color because color is weird and light is weird and it doesn't matter. In addition, they have biochromes, which allow them to make metallic shades of blue and blue-green, which just looks freaky cool, but even scientists don't seem to understand that part really. And to make all of that weirder, they can polarize the light too. I don't remember much from my physics lab, but there's something with polarized light be being parallel lines of light and who cares, I don't. But they can polarize light and that polarized light can then be perceived by other organisms underwater. We currently have no clue if they actually use this polarized light for more communication, but it seems indicated that they do. So we think they do, we're just trying to actually figure out if they do at this point. 
The third type of cells is the leucophores, which I just didn't really understand. It's something about diffusing and reflecting light, and I don't get the difference between the iridophores force and the leucophores. So let me just read something out for you. Maybe you'll understand it then. There's the light bending iridophores, the light reflecting leucophores, and the light absorbing chromatophores. So maybe that helps you understand better. Yeah, anyway, together they make the patterns and the colors and it's really cool how they figure out what to make their skin look like. To make it even cooler, as I said, they can change the texture of their skin. To achieve the structure, they use papillae, which they can inflate to make shapes, kind of like a balloon they can control. And then they can make these bumps on their skin look like whatever they need them to look like to blend in. It's fucking impressive. I know I keep saying these things are fucking impressive, but they are fucking impressive. Scientists are working hard to codify these patterns and shapes and colors and all that so that others can use that to make up a connection between the language and the behavior. So what they're trying to do is essentially write down the words that the couples have to communicate so that others then don't have to describe all the things and can just say, okay, this couple was doing this and that and they were doing pattern X and locomotive behavior or whatever. So they can figure out how they all connect and they hope that if they have the words, they have an easier time understanding the language. The really fascinating thing is how sneaky these bastards are when it comes to mating. So I told you they can signal different things with both halves of their body. So they could signal aggression to another male while courting the female. But what's way cooler is that smaller males pretend to be females. So they tuck in their sperm donating arms so they can't be seen and and signal with the colors that they are females not receptive to mating. And they look around, pick a female, and start courting the female while still pretending to the male that they are indeed females themselves. And then when the big buff dude doesn't attack them, they get closer and closer, and when the dude isn't paying attention, they sneak in to mate. And if the female is receptive to it, then they blow out the sperm of the big buff dude and mate with the female themselves. And the cool thing is that the big buff dude is none the wiser, so he will continue protecting the female until the female is ready to lay the eggs, now with the sperm of the other male. Very, very sneaky bastards indeed. What I personally find most interesting is that there seems to be a mismatch of what the males perceive as best and the females. So the males will go into a proverbial, what the Germans would call a Schwanzvergleich, so comparing of dick size, to decide who the biggest, buffest male is. And that's the one who gets the female. But the female seems to have other criteria to decide who to let the father of her children be. So sure, she'll let the big buff dude fuck her, but she won't let him father her children. I don't know, there seem to be a lot of parallels to humans somewhere in there. I really wish we could talk to cuddles. I wish I could talk to all the animals I want to talk to just for one day, being able to ask them all the questions about their behavior, because I think there's a lot we're misunderstanding or just not understanding about animals. We keep finding new really cool things if we're patient enough to pay attention. If humanity could just get their heads out of their asses and be a little more patient and stop pretending like they are better than the rest of the world, we would probably be able to understand nature so much better. If you think all of that is impressive, let's return to our bobtails for a second, because they have an organ called the light organ, where symbiotic bacteria allow them to glow in the dark. Seriously, they have symbiotic bacteria in there that are bioluminescent, and with that they can counter-illuminate. So what they do is they make their belly glow in the dark, so when someone looks at them from the bottom, they have the same shade as the higher water levels that are lighter than the bottom ones. They only do it at the bottom side, so if you look at them from above, they still blend in with the darker bottoms. An example of a species that does this is the Hawaiian bobtail squid that we talked about before, Euprima scolopis. They live in the Central Pacific Ocean, so very not surprisingly around Hawaii, Hawaiian bobtail squid. I know. They are teeny, teeny, tiny. Like I said, a little over an inch, three centimeters, not very big at all, but they have these symbiotic bacteria that allow them to glow in the dark. 
thanks to the bioluminescent Alivibrio fishery bacteria, they can thus avoid their main predator, the Hawaiian monk seal, which for some reason really like these tasty little snacks. Due to their size, they are model organisms, so researchers are putting them in labs and looking at them in depth. SpaceX even sent some to space a couple years ago. I know, it's weird, right? There are many more cute species in the cuddles and bobtails. Honestly, they are all kind of cute. So it was really hard to pick which ones to talk about because you can just randomly draw them and they are all really, really cool. So here are just some examples. Last time I was really disappointed that I couldn't talk about the striped pajama squid. I know, they are aptly named because they have black and white stripes and they just look like they are wearing a pajama, but what's way more interesting is that they are both venomous and poisonous. Remember, poisonous if you're trying to eat something and you get hurt by eating it, and venomous if something tries to eat you and you get hurt by it. I know that's an oversimplification. Technically, it's also poisonous if you lick it or touch it because you just couldn't help yourself and you had to touchy touchy also poisonous. And it's also venomous if they bite you in defense, but yeah, kind of. So poisonous is a passive thing, whereas um, venomous is if they actively inject you with something or if somehow get that toxin into you. Most animals are either venomous or poisonous, so the fact that the striped pajama squid Zipuloidea linulata is both is really cool. An example of a toxic cuttle is Metazepia pfeffery, the flamboyant cuttle, which has poisonous muscle tissue, so if you eat it, you'll get the toxin into yourself, and it's thought to be as lethal as the blue-ringed octopus. I still think it's a little weird to have a defense system that kills you before it teaches the other animal that you're poisonous. I know the colors are supposed to signal that, and it's really pretty with vibrant pinks and oranges and contrasting black and white, but still weird. I know evolution is then gonna teach the predator that you're not edible and they won't even try eating you, but still it's a very long-term process to go with poisonous instead of venomous. Speaking of colors, no matter if they signal poison or not, the most beautiful colors, in my opinion, are those of the hummingbird bobtail squid, Euprima berry, which is metallic blues and metallic purples, and it's just such a beautiful color. They are so fucking cute and adorable. Honestly, you can just look at any cuddle or bobtail and they'll be cute and exciting and pretty. I just don't know. Just take another look at that Australian giant one we looked before, the Sepia Apama, and it has a rainbow of color. It has all the colors of the rainbow. It's really, really, really pretty. I mean, seriously, you should Google that one because I can't show you the images I really want to show you. I'll link the nicest one I found in the show notes just so you can look at it. They are fucking cool. That rainbow color is just so beautiful, and they are big too, so you can see it in all its splendor. And the list goes on and on and on, so these are essentially just random examples I chose, some of them just because of the cool name. I'll let you guess which one I chose because of their characteristics and which one I chose because of the names, but anyway, I could just keep talking about cute and adorable and fascinating cuddles and bobtails forever, so here's as good a place to stop as any. And I've definitely talked a lot because I get excited by these cute little things. I really hope you learned something new about nature today and how fucking cool our planet is. Well, not our planet. We should really stop calling it that. How fucking cool this planet is. These episodes take forever to make because there's a lot of research and memorizing weird taxonomic names and facts and shit but they are well worth it to me and I'm enjoying the series so much. If you want to keep me going, consider becoming a Patreon and supporting for as little as two bucks a month or buying me a coffee as a one-time donation. And if you can't spare the coin, there's no money ways to support me by liking, subscribing, commenting, or just looking up my name in your favorite podcast app and rating my podcast there. Know someone who might enjoy nature facts and having their mind blown with how cool this planet is? You could tell them about the show and spread the word about me. All these things help more than you can know. As always, a special thank you to my loyal patrons Robert and Paul and the lovely people who have been sending me one-time donations. Every single one of you rocks. You guys are awesome. Until next time, weirdly yours, Kate Hildenbrand.